Hi, Nikki. Good morning. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? You're a little quiet, but yes. Okay. There you go. That's perfect. All right. Great. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for this presentation on community building uh, using peer review to engage librarians and faculty in the design of an OER community of learning. My name is Nikki Whiteside, and I am the moderator for this session. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before we hand it over to the presenters. Uh, all attendees are on mute for the session, but you will be able to type in the chat and uh, ask questions or uh, comments there if you have anything to add. And um, there is closed captioning available. If you need that, you will need to click on the live transcript icon uh, in the Zoom window to turn that on for your, uh, for your individual uh, viewing. I, the meeting is being recorded, and uh, since we have such a brief time for this, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to the presenters. Jessica McLean is the lead presenter for this, so I am letting her, uh, I'm handing it over. Jessica? Thank you very much, Nikki. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as Nikki said, our presentation is Community Building, Using Peer Review to Engage Librarians and Faculty in the Design of an OER Community of Learning. And we are members of the scholarly communications team from Texas State University. We'll do brief introductions. My name is Jessica McLean. I'm a research instruction outreach librarian, and I work with subjects in the physical sciences and engineering. I'm Amanda Price. I'm an acquisitions librarian. My name is Diana Morganti. I'm also a research instruction and outreach librarian for math, computer science, and computer information systems. Hi, I'm Stephanie Towery. I'm the Copyright Officer, and I'm also the Subject Librarian for Theater and Dance. And I'm Laura Wall, the Digital Collections Librarian. Okay, so first I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project. This is something we've been working on for about a year and a half. Originally, the Scholarly Communications team was tasked with creating a community of practice around OER, but as we started that planning, we discovered that we had a lot of experience of certain misconceptions and some hesitation around OER that we thought would um, not cause that community to grow any further than those people who were already engaged in OER activity. So we wanted to take a step back and focus on the community of learning as a starting point. The course that we've designed has two purposes. First of all, to help develop that baseline of knowledge about OER to correct those misconceptions and to make sure that everyone on campus has that same knowledge to help them get started with OER projects. We designed the course to have five self-paced modules that are built in Canvas. I'll show you those in a moment. And our biggest goal, I think, was to create something that was not only instructional on OER, but also helped us demonstrate some best practices in OER. So it is an OER about OER so that we can show that OERs can be very high quality um, tools and resources. And in addition to that, we'll tell them a little bit more about how to do that. So let me go ahead and show you. Here is our course in Canvas. This is the homepage. We'll talk later on about the peer review process, but you can see here on our homepage, we do give credit to our peer reviewers. There were two rounds of peer review. So these are our first round reviewers and our second round reviewers. And down here again, this is identifying this as an open educational resource. Looking at our modules, there are five modules in addition to kind of the starting point. Each one of these modules has the instructional material, but also has some common points. So there is the introduction, a live session, which again, I'll talk about in a moment. There is a reflection where there's an opportunity for the participants to discuss the topics with each other. And there's also a quiz. We wanted to add a quiz to each of these modules, not only to help the participants self-reflect on how much they've learned, but also because for now, this is a voluntary opportunity where people participate in the course because they're interested. We hope in the future this may become something that's a little bit more formal 
it may end up being something like an educational prerequisite for some kind of grant funding program. In that case, we want to make sure that participants who go through demonstrate that they have in fact participated and understood everything along the way. So our modules are a quick introduction. So talking about definitions, the value of OER and a little bit of a, a preview of what's to come. Module two is finding OER. So talking about some of the resources available to them and also some points to think about as they are finding and evaluating their options. Module three is using and creating OER. So talking about ways to get started, the steps you can take and some of the best practices for adoption and adaption, adaptation. <laughs> module four is licensing. So a little bit more about open licensing and creative commons. We found through our peer review that this is something that people struggled with even after finishing the course. So we ended up moving it down and adding a, a little bit more bulk to the instruction here. And then finally ending with a section on OER at Texas State specifically. So listing some of the resources and support available to them as they begin their OER projects. So that's the learning part of it. The other part of it is the community. And as I showed you in those modules, there are those live sessions that support each of the modules. So this is kind of how we get everyone together to share their experience and also su supplement the content in the modules with things that are relevant to the participants in the course. So this allows the participants to bounce ideas off each other. It also will then give them a network so that they can continue to advocate for OER on campus and it allows them to invest in the value of OER and become ambassadors or champions on campus. Okay, we're gonna get into some of the background, um, defining the project, its purpose, structure, and goals. When we came together to plan for this project, our focus was to provide a framework uh, by tapping into faculty workflows what they care most about and what motivates them most. Um, we wanted the program to be workable with their busy schedules um, and a self-paced program would be, we felt would be the best fit for this. Um, we wanted it to have an element of support and community. Uh, we wanted it to encompass quality scholarship and most importantly, peer review um, so that faculty could take an active role in shaping the content to their evolving needs. Um, we felt that with faculty being involved in the process, um, it would provide a sense of ownership and lend further legitimacy to the quality of the program and the content within the faculty ecosystem. Um, it was also important that it's not just a librarian produced product that stands independently. So the peer review not only taps into a main faculty value, but this approach also allows faculty to both vet and develop the content based on their evolving needs. Next slide, please. Um, Long-term use of peer review in the course development. So our purpose was to build a framework um, that provided foundational knowledge that would carry forward, uh, make it valuable enough, sustainable, and ever-evolving. Uh, going forward, we envision that faculty can be the main drivers of the content and also be the main recruitment arm uh, of subsequent cohorts among their faculty peers. Um, librarians can provide a support network for expertise on topics. Uh, such as licensing or locating quality content and can continue to create content based on um, feedback as needed and to continue that iterative process. Speed my time. So as, a, as Amanda mentioned, our work with faculty was two-pronged, both in engaging in peer review and then becoming part of the community that was being built, as well as promoting the community. And so I'm gonna talk about how we looked for partners on campus, um, not just for peer review and collaboration, but um, our next speaker is gonna also talk about some really good collaborations for promotion. We want to look for the folks on campus who are already working in advocacy of student affordability. 
Um, look for the people who have influence also on the growth of faculty. Um, new faculty are particularly keen to adopt the priorities of the university that they have joined, and they may not already be um, indoctrinated in some of the outdated beliefs that hold some senior faculty back. In our climate, we had a committee working on textbook affordability, which is being led by the um, Office of Distance Learning and the Provost's Office. Uh, we also had a, a longstanding relationship with the Faculty Development Office through our research instruction and outreach program, which Jessica and I are members of. Um, and then our scholarly communications team, which all five of us were members of, had also been doing faculty development workshops for several years. So these intersecting priorities and these intersecting relationships really influence the quality of faculty textbook choice and affordability of those choices. So here in our environment, that meant that we collaborated with those offices. Consider what offices you can collaborate with in your environment. So, like I said, we collaborated with faculty in a couple of different ways, finding peer reviewers and promotion, and Stephanie is going to talk about that next. Hi, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem of promoting the community of learning. Um, we, we do really well with um, promoting it in our yeah, within the library, but we know we needed to reach out to stakeholders outside of the library um, and to, to help us. Um, so one of the things we knew was that our, um, I, what we call ITAC, which is computer support, um, was meeting regularly with our faculty development um, director and also with our distance learning director. So they were having a monthly or weekly meeting. Um, and so I, I knew about that. And so what we decided to do was to try to get on their, um, to pitch an idea at their meeting. So we set up a, a time to meet and basically just pitched our idea. We gave them access um, to our materials ahead of time and they, basically spent an hour telling us, um, giving us feedback on how we can promote it. And then they offered, um, the faculty development offered to um, have us come and present at their faculty focus, at one of their faculty focus events. So that really helped. They put us in their newsletter, I believe. Um, but we did get a lot of tips too that we built into the course um, about promotion. and. Um, it helped us to fill our pilot and we hope that we continue these relationships in the future. Okay, so a little bit more information about the actual peer review process that was designed for the course. We started our first round of peer review in late summer 2020 uh, after we had finished the first draft of the modules. Each module was created by a different member of the scholarly communications team. What I created was a document with the guidelines for review, which contained expectations, including due dates and what they were going to have to do for each of the modules, a little bit more information about the process, and then also some best practices of what to look for and how to report it in a way that would help us make those changes in a, in a simple way. The first group that we recruited was library staff. And the reason we did that was for a couple of reasons. First of all, because we built the course in Canvas. Canvas was a relatively new software to our university. So there were a lot of things we still did not know about Canvas. Particularly, there were some things that we weren't sure if they were gonna work. There were some issues about giving permissions for images, for example. And if you didn't give the correct permissions, then the image just didn't show up. And we, as the creators, never saw that. So that was an important thing for them to review. The other thing was just generally to make sure that we were covering the topic in a way that was understandable. And so we recruited 18 reviewers from all across the library, from administrators to library assistants, from departments including public services, uh, collection development, archivists, subject librarians. So we had a really great range of people who had a lot of experience with OER and very little experience with OER. So we got a really great amount of feedback from them. They were given two surveys to do their review. First of all, built in Canvas site, there was a technical review, which basically just asked them to give us feedback on if the links were working correctly, if the images were displaying correctly, if the videos played as we 
as we expected them to. I also created an anonymous survey in Qualtrics that asked them more about the content, whether our um, language was appropriate, whether our supporting information was appropriate, and you'll see more about that on the next slide. We got some really fantastic feedback about that that Laura will talk about in a moment. And we thanked these reviewers with a letter of appreciation from the scholarly communications team. And as you saw, their names are listed in the homepage of that module. So after that first round of review, uh, later in the fall semester, we made those edits as suggested by our reviewers and then began a second round of review with faculty members. One big lesson that I learned was that having two surveys was unnecessary. A lot of our reviewers put all of their comments in the survey that was within Canvas because it was right there, really easy to get to. Uh, so I cut that one and focused only on the Qualtrics survey to make sure that the feedback was anonymous. Again, we, at this point, we didn't really need to work on technical issues anymore because by now we were pretty familiar with it and we thought we had worked on most of the kinks. So the feedback we were looking for from faculty members was on the content, the appropriateness for the audience, and generally if they thought we had anything that we could do to make it more appealing to their peers. We reached out to faculty members who already had experience with OER. So we expected these people to be kind of our early champions of this project. So we're, we had staff members and faculty from faculty development, distance education, instructional design, as well as departments like humanities and nursing. Again, their feedback was incredibly helpful and valuable. And again, as acknowledgement, they got a letter of appreciation and acknowledgement in the modules. And so here's just a quick rundown of what our rubric looked like. We asked about the amount of time it took to complete the modules. We had been kind of advertising it as a uh, pretty low stress, short amount of time, about 30 minutes per module. So we wanted to check that before we went ahead. And then as far as the second point here, you'll see organization, completeness of the information, wording to avoid jargon, supporting resources being um, valuable rather than just decorative, and the quiz making sure that that was an appropriate measure of what was being uh, taught in that module. Yes, I know. Um, so yes, just to elaborate very briefly on this, um, of course, asking for feedback, everyone's a critic, but that was extremely important in this process. So we needed that, that type of feedback. And some of the issues that were identified initially, you know, streamlining the licensing statements, because of course we are reusing OERs to create an OER and making sure that since we had different people creating different modules, making sure that everything was consistent. Also hyperlinks, um, we, we were very new to Canvas um, that was launched during this process. So um, notice, noting that the hyperlinks shouldn't be spelled out um, just to ensure accessibility. And then also noting the different sections that needed more time and coverage. Um, obviously, copyright and licensing usually tends to. Um, and then making sure that the instructions are very clear, um, just because, you know, uh, as developing the actual course modules, you look at it 50 times and you may not notice little things. So um, all of that was really valuable to have other people contribute and comment on what they were looking for and what their perception of it is. Um, I mean, a big part of this was also that people were coming in at different levels of knowledge on OERs. So recognizing that. Um, and that also kind of comes back to also maintaining the initial scope for the project, because some people may want more detail on certain areas and some may want less detail it just varies so maintaining a scope and consistency throughout that has helped um, but really the open dialogue has been great 
even with our scholarly communication team and module folks developing this, and then with all the reviewers. So, yeah. So our last slide here is just some future considerations. Uh, we are currently in the spring semester in our pilot cohort. We have 16, now 15 faculty members running through the course. So we have been learning a lot this semester and thinking about how we can make changes in the future. So four points that we're considering. First of all, we do need to update the content as OER is a rapidly changing field. But as Laura mentioned, we do need to balance that need for updating with the need to limit our course scope. Uh, that is kind of a benefit of having those live sessions in between the modules because those can really supplement and go into more depth on some of those topics while the course remains limited in its scope. In the future, we would like to open the course to other audiences, staff, administrators, and students, graduate students especially may find this interesting. Uh, the question then is kind of how do we manage that? Uh, would multiple people have to administer different cohorts? Uh, possible partnerships in the future, I had mentioned as far as the quizzes, we potentially may want to make this something that is tied into grant funding or otherwise is something that is required of faculty members rather than just a voluntary uh, participation. And then finally, our scholarly communications team is a rolling membership. So our team members have two or three year terms for the most part. Uh, this is the end of my two year term. So the question is in the future, who will be responsible for administering this course? And how do we package up the information of what we've learned so far in a way that can be handed off to someone else in the future? And with that, we would be happy to take some questions and there are some links and, and information here if you would like to contact us later on. Um, I did see one question that was in the chat room that I don't believe was answered. Uh, it's, is there a link for the course uh, that is public and does not require Canvas login? Currently there is not. Um, because it is intended to be kind of a cohort right now, it is limited to the people who are participating in the cohort. That is something I've been thinking a lot about this week especially. So in the future, there may be a way to look at that, but right now it is limited to participants only. Okay, um, I believe the other questions were answered in the chat and I do not see any others coming up right now. We'll give it just a second. Uh, while we're waiting to see if any other questions come in, I know we wrap up at 1125. I want to thank the presenters for sharing with us. I have uh, quite, a, quite a few notes here that I'm sure I will be reaching out with questions. So uh, this is very exciting and it looks like a great project you have going there at Texas State. I um, also want to thank all of the attendees and remind you that there will be um, an email coming out following the conference with a survey please take a few minutes to complete that for us so that we have feedback and can uh, build on our successes from this year and improve the conference for next year. And with that, uh, I wanna thank everyone and wish everyone uh, a great conference. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>